E Brad Smith, o vice-chairman e presidente da Microsoft, foi a Bruxelas no último dia 21 de fevereiro, no dia que eles tinham que se apresentar para os, os reguladores, no caso ali do CMA, o órgão regulador do Reino Unido, e aproveitou e fez uma coletiva de imprensa a, em portas fechadas para alguns selecionados jornalistas ao redor do mundo, como Tom Warren e Jess Corning, que estavam lá presenciando essa grande fala ali do mestre Brad Smith, e ele comentou muito, um vídeo de 12 minutos, como que a gente tem aí, legendado, por mim, essa pessoa que vos fala aqui na Central Xbox para vocês, de tudo que ele comentou a respeito do que ele enxerga e de como as coisas estão acontecendo e como funciona do ponto de vista dele, no passado, no presente e no futuro, o que vai acontecer, o que aconteceu, o que está acontecendo com relação à compra da Activision Blizzard, aprovação dos reguladores e também o caso do licenciamento de Call of Duty para Nintendo, Nvidia, como a Sony está se comportando e muito mais. Esse vídeo é incrível, assiste até o fim. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. It's been an important day for us at Microsoft and for our friends at Activision Blizzard here in Brussels. As you all know, there's been an important hearing today before the European Commission. I'm not in a position to describe exactly what was said, but I think I can capture some of what makes today so important. We started the morning, as you know, with a new announcement. We announced that Microsoft had reached a binding 10-year definitive legal agreement with Nintendo, an agreement that builds on the other Xbox games we have been making available, an agreement that obligates Microsoft for the next 10 years to make Call of Duty available for Nintendo and its Switch devices. That was how we began the day. This evening, we have another agreement to announce, and in some ways, I think perhaps it might even be a little more important still. Because as you know, we had a letter of intent that we announced with Nintendo late last year. This evening, we're announcing an agreement with NVIDIA. NVIDIA has people here. We have a press release we'll provide you with as you leave. Though their representatives will be in a position to answer questions as well. Why is NVIDIA important? Because as you've been hearing, This acquisition of Activision Blizzard is not only about bringing Call of Duty to, and into the future with console gaming, but it's also about Microsoft's opportunity to help build a better cross-platform future for everyone in gaming. And NVIDIA plays an important role. NVIDIA's GeForce Now cloud gaming service already has more than 25 million users. In fact, They already reach Chromebooks, they reach MacBooks, they reach a wide variety of other devices. And what we have done in this agreement with NVIDIA is twofold. First, effective right away, Microsoft will be bringing its Xbox games that play on PCs to NVIDIA's GeForce Now cloud streaming service. And in addition, if this acquisition is approved, we will also bring all of Activision Blizzard's titles, including Call of Duty, to GeForce Now as well. That is significant, because now we're addressing the full range of issues that have been raised by regulators as topics of not just interest, but in some cases, concern. And I think it gives us the opportunity to step back, if you will, and look at what this acquisition means for the future of gaming. For us at Microsoft, this has never been about spending $69 billion so that we could acquire titles like Call of Duty and make them less available to people. That's actually not a great way to turn a $69 billion asset into something that will become more valuable over time. To the contrary, since day one, we have been focused on one thing. Using this acquisition to bring more games to more people on more platforms and devices than ever before, to bring more competition into gaming than ever before. And so what we're announcing today is in fact true to the roots of the very first day when we announced this acquisition 13 months ago. As many of you know, it's been 13 fairly eventful months in terms of the work that we've had to do to talk to people around the world about this deal. 
And while I'm not in a position to say exactly what was said in the hearing room, I think there are a few facts that are important to recognize. First, to think about where people stand as they've set forth their point of view about this deal. The European Game Developers Federation has endorsed this deal. They represent more than 2,000 gaming studios across Europe. This is the voice of Europe's small game studios. And they stand by our side to advance this deal, in part because they, like us, see the future as cross-platform. Second, the voice of employees in uni, an employment labor organization, has similarly endorsed this deal. They put an announcement out as recently as yesterday. Third, if you look at every agency around the world that has surveyed consumers, consumers have said by a substantial margin that they support this deal. If you listen to what Valve, the world's largest game store for PCs has said, they've said they support this deal. And now NVIDIA says that it supports this deal as well. And I think we all stand together because we really do see increasingly a stark choice for the regulators of the world. It's really a question of whether they want to block this deal or approve it with a set of guardrails, remedies with conditions. And as we've said since the earliest days of this deal, just as we're comfortable, indeed even eager, to enter into private agreements that will have binding legal effect for a decade, we're also more than prepared to address the questions that people may have with regulatory undertakings as well. But think about the alternative that now exists. On the one hand, regulators can choose if they want to try to block the deal, something that the Federal Trade Commission acted late last year to do. But think about the market. Think about the market in Europe. Think about the market that the Federal Trade Commission defined and what it would mean here in Europe. It is a market in which Sony has an 80% share. Xbox has 20% share. Globally, it's about 70-30. In Japan, it's 96 to 4. And while there are some fluctuations over time, these numbers have been remarkably steady for two decades. Even last year, when Sony suffered constraints in its supply chain and it saw its numbers dip, they came back strong in the fourth quarter as their supply chain recovered. By our calculation on a global basis, Sony outsold Microsoft in the fourth quarter by a margin of 69 to 31, pretty much consistent with the global market shares we've seen for 20 years. Sony, like the regulators, has an alternative as well. It can either do a deal with Microsoft or argue that this deal should be blocked. We understand in some ways it can be tempting when you have an 80% share to just hope that the future never arrives, to hold on as long as possible to a current market share, to hope that that future that, as European game developers have said, is cross-platform, doesn't come until a later date. But I don't think that's what regulators are in the business of doing. They're not here to protect super dominant companies. Believe me, I know. I've come to Brussels, as some of you know, for many years, for many hearings, and it never occurred to me to suggest that a company with such a large market share needed to be protected by smaller firms in a market as they sought to grow and innovate. But think about this market that exists today. It has about 120 million consoles, PlayStation and Xbox combined. And now think about what we did today, between this morning and this evening, between Nintendo and NVIDIA. We are bringing Call of Duty to 150 million more people to 150 million devices that don't have access to Call of Duty today. That is a future where competition flourishes, where innovation moves forward. One of the things that we recognize here in Brussels 
is the importance of the European Commission. As some of you know, I've been coming here for, frankly, more years and decades than I probably even care to admit. I've come to many hearings in the building across the street. And as we think about this acquisition, I think it calls for leadership by the European Commission akin to the kinds of technology leadership the Commission has shown in so many years, across so many decades, for so many parts of the technology sector. I remember when I first started coming here in 1989, it was just five years after the Commission had entered into an undertaking with IBM, an undertaking that opened up the mainframe market for computers. That was followed, as you all know, by a, a focus beginning in the 1990s on a new generation of technology, the PC and Windows, among other things. For Microsoft, one of the most important days in our history from a competition law perspective was the 16th of December, 2009. That was the day that we entered into an undertaking with the European Commission, an undertaking that is still in force today, an undertaking that ensures that we provide access to competitors for interoperability information that includes file formats and protocol documents across a wide range of our products. That undertaking is far more complicated than anything that the Commission is likely to need to consider here. And yet you probably haven't written about it in a decade because there's been no controversy. And yet it changed the course of technology history. If you want to write a document in Microsoft Word and edit it in Google Docs, you can, no matter where you are in the world because of that undertaking. And similarly, on the 6th of December 2016, the European Commission approved our acquisition of LinkedIn with similar access requirements, requirements that obligated us, for example, to enable LinkedIn's competitors to access Microsoft Office on terms comparable to LinkedIn itself. So at Microsoft, we have deep and long experience in complying well with the kinds of remedies that make sense in this case, the kinds of remedies that will ensure that Call of Duty remains available on other consoles, the kind of remedy that will, remain, that will ensure that Call of Duty and other games remain available in the cloud and even on alternative operating systems like Chrome OS and for Chromebooks. We came to Brussels more than prepared to roll up our sleeves and make that kind of solution work because we know that that's what it will take to grow this market further. We haven't yet reached an agreement with Sony. I hope we will. I walk around with an envelope that contains the definitive agreement that we sent to Sony two days before Christmas. I'm ready to sign it at any time. And if Sony doesn't like the words, we're ready to sit down and pull out a pen or a version of Microsoft Word and its cut and paste features. We know that advances in everything in life require dialogue. We're committed to that. We're committed to that with the European Commission. We're committed to that with other regulators around the world. We're committed to that with other companies in our industry. We're committed to that with Sony itself. And I hope and believe that this is a day, like many other days that I've spent in Brussels, that will advance our industry and regulation in a responsible way. Get mad. I guess I'm free.